Hello, welcome to the Sex Ed. I'm your host, Liz Goldwyn, founder of thesexed.com, your number one source for sex, health, and consciousness education. My guest today is Corinna Longworth, creator of You Must Remember This, a hugely popular storytelling podcast about the secrets and forgotten histories of early Hollywood, and it's one of my personal favorites. Corinna is also the author of the book Seduction, Sex, Lies, and Stardom in Howard Hughes Hollywood, about the women whose careers and lives the legendary Hughes changed. If you, like me, can't get enough golden age of cinema scandal, I highly recommend you pick up a copy. I caught up with Corinna during her book tour to learn about what behind-the-scenes dirt she uncovered during her research, and the film industry's treatment of women as sex objects, back then and now. Thank you for being here. Of course. Did you always have a fascination with the seedy side of Hollywood growing up? Well, I, I think growing up, I was fascinated with Hollywood and old Hollywood. I mean, I grew up in L.A. in the 80s and 90s, and it you know it just didn't seem unusual to be interested in the old stars. I mean, I remember them talking about whatever Elizabeth Taylor was doing that day on the local news. Um, my mom was really into Natalie Wood and, and various different stories that were tragic, I guess. But for me, it was just normal and fascinating. Who was your sort of silver screen icon when you were a kid? I think the first person was Lauren Bacall. Um, And I think I just sort of really responded to her style and her sort of like sarcastic, like slurry way of talking. And, um, And then I saw How to Marry a Millionaire, and she's just a boss in that movie. And it was really exciting to see that when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15. Mine was Barbara Stanwyck. Oh, of course. Um, Amazing. Yeah, when she crosses her legs with the ankle bracelet. (laughs) I didn't see actresses, contemporary actresses at that time, radiate as much strength. I think probably in the 80s and 90s, those kind of roles weren't really around for women. Not as much, for sure. Let's talk about the Hayes Code, which was enforced with an iron fist. And the Hayes Commission rules reshaped and watered down what the public saw on screen. Can you sort of break it down for us? Yeah. So um, there were all these scandals in Hollywood in the early 1920s. People have maybe heard of the Fatty Arbuckle scandal where this comedian was accused of raping and killing a woman. Um, And, you know, there's some evidence that he maybe did have sex with her. There's no concrete evidence that he did rape and kill her. Um, But it became the first nationwide Hollywood scandal. And there were nationwide calls to just basically end the film industry um, from Catholic groups and and other reforming groups. Um, These groups had just pushed through prohibition. And so the film industry was really afraid that they could actually kill the movie industry. So as a show that they were changing their ways, they hired the former Postmaster General, Will Hayes, to come to Hollywood and police them. Um, and they hired this guy specifically because they thought he could, they could control him and that there wouldn't actually need to be, like, severe change. And so what you get in the late 1920s and the early 1930s is actually more sexual permissiveness in movies. We call this the pre-code era. A lot of this has to do with, like, the beginning of sound film um, and with dialogue you know, you could have a new type of flirtation on screen. You could have new, more adult sexual situations. And so that really, (laughs) really brought back this new wave of people saying, we have to crack down on the movies. And so Hayes and a bunch of Catholic leaders basically put together this code, which became known as the Hayes Code, and that was instituted in 1934. And some of the rules that were in the code were, it was a, you could only have people kissing for a certain length of time. Um, Anybody who had sex out of wedlock needed to be punished either with jail or murder. (laughs) There was no quote unquote miscegenation, um, which meant that white people and black people or Asian people or anybody who was not white could not be seen having a romance on screen, which helped to make the screen whiter. Um, uh, there was, you know, controls about things like guns and booze and, and stuff like that. But most of the controls were about sex. They were very controlling as well about costumes. Um, I read through all the papers in my grandfather's archive relating to the film Ball of Fire. Uh Uh-huh. It was a Barbara Stanwyck, Gary Cooper film directed by Howard Hawks. Billy Wilder wrote the script in, in which Barbara Stanwyck's character originally was a burlesque queen. Of course, that was a no from the Hayes Commission. Um, and then they made such specific cuts and suggestions to her wardrobe where it was like um, 
the waistband of her skirt had to be um, taken up like three centimeters. Uh, it's just so nitpicky and specific. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's in my book, but there was a point where Howard Hughes was trying to release this movie, The Outlaw, which featured Jane Russell in a lot of low-cut blouses. And he and his publicist actually mounted a stunt when they were appealing to the Hayes Code, where they the Hayes Code was saying that there was too much of her breasts being shown. And so they took blow-ups of these other actresses in other movies, and they hired a scientist to go from each one with a protractor, measuring the amount of flesh being shown to prove that Jane Russell was not showing more flesh than the other actresses. Speaking of Jane Russell, I was wearing a bullet bra last night. Nice. And I was explaining to my boyfriend the origin <laughs> of the bullet bra, and I, I mentioned you and that um, and Howard Hughes and his engineering skills. Can you give us some of the truth behind this myth that Howard Hughes invented the bullet bra? Okay, so actually what he wanted to do with breasts was the opposite of that. He wanted to give the illusion that a woman was not wearing a bra on screen and that her breasts were just sort of jiggling naturally, while at the same time, obviously having them be lifted up. And so he used his, you know, aeronautical knowledge and he designed a bra for Jane Russell to wear in The Outlaw. And she tried it on and she just thought it was uncomfortable and ridiculous and that it actually looked bad under the costume. So she took her existing bra and covered the seams with tissue so that you couldn't see the seams of the bra under the costume. And Howard Hughes didn't notice the difference. He thought that she was wearing his bra. I guess men always like to think that they reinvented the wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting, too, at this time in Hollywood with the Hayes Code being so strict about portraying these heterosexual romantic ideals, presenting to the public that certain movie stars are, are heterosexual. But behind the cameras, it was a totally different story. Can you speak a little to that? Because you go into quite a bit of detail in the book. So in the book, I talk a lot about Katherine Hepburn, who when she arrived in Hollywood, she did have a husband, but he didn't come with her. He stayed on the East Coast, and she came to Los Angeles with her female best friend, and Katherine Hepburn wore pants. And she projected this image on screen that was really unlike what other actresses were doing at the time. It was much stronger, and to the eyes of that time, it was considered to be masculine. Um, and... There was actual gossip in, you know, newspapers and magazines and fan magazines about what her sexual orientation was. And, of course, it was the early 1930s, so it was coded, but it wasn't that coded. Um, and it really seems like there was this panic about was was Catherine Hepburn heterosexual? And if she wasn't, that would be a huge problem. And so – Around this same time, she starts this relationship with Howard Hughes, which changes the way that she's covered in the media. And suddenly all of the media is about when is she going to marry this dashing playboy aviator? And immediately after that, her career, which had been slumping, she had had a series of box office bombs, her career is resurrected through the play and then the film, The Philadelphia Story. And so, I mean, I think from looking at everything I looked at and I read in the book, that this relationship with Howard Hughes, which some people don't think was real, um, but I think was a genuine relationship. I don't know like how intensely sexual it was, but I think they, they did love each other. Um, I think that relationship rehabbed her image so that she was able to continue this long, you know, really fruitful Hollywood star career. And was great for his image, too. Absolutely. He was, uh, he was a master publicist, um, and, and especially using his relationships and women to build himself up as this billionaire playboy, which I found interesting when you went into some of the economics, that he actually wasn't, especially at the beginning of his career, as wealthy as we think he was. No, uh, he was really highly leveraged in the 1930s. Um, when he arrived in Los Angeles, he had actually had to had just had to spend most of his fortune buying off his family members so that he could have sole control of his dead father's oil drill bit business. Um, and then he continued to spend money on things like um, arranging his divorce, arranging the divorce of the silent actress Billy Dove, who he thought he was going to marry but did not, um, paying for movies for Billy Dove to be in that then became box office bombs. So he actually got to the point around 1932 where even though he had just produced a major hit in the first Scarface, he had to get out of the movie business because he couldn't afford to keep going. Going back for a moment to Kate Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, George Cukor, 
Um, I found also interesting in your book that even the 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 homophobia of Hollywood at, the, at that time was so latent, left such a big mark that even decades and decades after the death of some of these icons, their estates um, remain invested in keeping them closeted. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that it, it, you know, from everything that it is available to read about Katherine Hepburn, it seems that she was definitely bisexual. Um, but the there is a woman who is in charge of her estate who says, no, that's not true. Um, and certainly there are biographers, the, the biographer of Spencer Tracy, who wrote, uh, James Curtis, who wrote an excellent 900-page book. He is fervent that they had a real heterosexual romance. Um, so, you know, I mean, some of these things, I don't know if it matters that much exactly who people had sex with, but it really is interesting, um, just to think of how they might have presented themselves in a different time when we can have a more honest and transparent conversation about how complicated sexuality is. Although, to speak on that point, I mean, even today, there's major male movie stars who remain closeted because it would ruin their bankability of being, you know, a romantic lead, um, yeah. which I find kind of fascinating even now. I mean, I th- I want to say it's easier for women to come out as, as at least bisexual. Um, I think it's still definitely difficult for men. Men in the public eye, you mean? Yeah. Why? Yeah, I think it, I think the culture is more accepting of women, you know, because there is still this sort of like dumb thing of like, oh, sexy girls having sex together, <laughs> you know. I mean, in in the, the way that culture is still patriarchal and male, like the gaze of culture is still male, it's more acceptable to think of the idea that a woman might have sex with women than it is acceptable to think of men having sex with men. You detail in the book how gender roles uh, were culturally enforced by matinee idols, which may have something to do with it. The idea of men as macho or swashbuckling Lotharios and women as either pure or fallen, which have, I mean, the time in which you're writing about and which your show, you must remember this, details, has literally taught generations of people how they're supposed to behave. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it... I think it was actually more, there was more nuance to these things in the silent era and in the early 1930s. The gender roles really became codified with the Hays Code, and it got, I think, worse after World War II, um, when culturally there was this sort of return to the home, um, this idea that women who had gone to work, like now they had to go back to their quote unquote real job of taking care of men and taking care of families. And the movies really just like put all their chips into reinforcing those ideas. What's one of your favorite fallen women pictures? Wow. Um, I mean, talking about Barbara Stanwyck, I really like baby face. Does that count? I think that counts. Yeah. I mean, cause she actually is sort of rising through like sex, but and then what about, you know, I guess Mary Pickford would be sort of the ideal pure heroine, right? Right, the D.W. Griffith model of, like, a woman who's basically a child um, who is, like, un- as soon as she is tainted by male lust, she's ruined. The virgin and the whore myth. It's hard to get away from that. At the time, magazines like Confidential were publishing these exposés of the sex and drug scandals of the stars, while, while simultaneously Hollywood gossip columnists like Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons were on studio payrolls to present more cleaned up versions. So in researching a book like, like this, how do you separate the reams of fact from fiction? I mean, it is difficult, and I just try to be transparent about um, ways in which I'm, like, places where I am able to sort of look behind the curtain because I have information from, say, like a publicist file or or somebody's memoir or somebody's unpublished memoir in some cases. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it's all just material for me to analyze, and I just try to be honest about um, what I when I don't know what the truth is and what I think the truth is probably most likely to be. 
Did you spend a lot of time at the Academy Library? Yeah, I'm always at the Academy Library, which is an incredible place. I'm always looking at the microfiche and in like the folders of clippings. Um, but a lot of this book is based on research I did in Austin, Texas at the State House, where they have just hundreds of boxes of files that were collected um, after Howard Hughes died when many parties were fighting over his will or his lack thereof, like fighting over his estate. And then... Um, there are files from his publicist, uh, Russell Birdwell, who helped create the image of Jane Russell at UCLA. And then I spent time in Las Vegas where um, he uses publicists that he hired from the mid-40s until the end of his life. All of their files are there. Yeah, I love that period of the end of his life in Vegas where he's yeah. locked up in the hotel rooms. Yeah, and just like literally he bought a television station so that he could call in and request movies to be played all night long on TV. Imagine having that kind of power. Yeah. <laughs> the, there's a great line in your book, um, which for me was a, a, an interesting take on on the way that you're looking at Howard Hughes and all and these women, really these women whose careers and lives he affected, which is the reality of women, quote, carving out spaces for freedom thanks to their alliances with powerful men. And so many of these women's um, stories have been previously lost in the footnotes of Hollywood history. Yeah. Was that the only choice we had as women back then? I don't know if it was the only choice, but it was definitely a pattern I noticed of, like, let's take, for example, Ida Lupino, who was an actress, a movie star, and she wanted to be a director. She was only able to do that um, by basically marrying a guy who had the power to be a producer and to help her create these independent productions. And then even after they divorced, they continued to work together. Yeah, I have a real problem with this um, this phrase, trophy wife or gold digger, mm -hmm. because it negates the fact that really up until 100 years ago, women didn't have that many economic choices. Absolutely. So, you know, you're basically saying that anyone who does what they have to do to get a get a foot in the door is immediately labeled well a fallen woman i guess yeah or or you know is taken less seriously um but i mean i don't know i mean in hollywood i think that maybe it wasn't quite wasn't quite looked down upon as much um i think that there was an understanding that if you were somebody like lois weber who um like was co-credited as a director with her husband. I think everybody kind of knew that she was the real director, but it was still just too politically like hot to for the idea to be out in the world that these movies were being directed by a woman by herself. And what about Dorothy Arzner? Yeah, I mean, well, Dorothy Arzner was an out lesbian in Hollywood and a director for, I don't know, I think about 20 years. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and I write about a movie that she made in the, bo in the book called uh, Christopher Strong, starring Katherine Hepburn, which I think is a, a really fascinating movie about the gender roles of the early 1930s. Can you break that down a little bit? Yeah, so uh, Katherine Hepburn plays um, a, like a Amelia Earhart-style aviatrix, and she gets involved with a married man. Um, and she, at first she's resistant because she's, she's never seeded her career to love before. And she wants to break all these aviation records, but slowly this man kind of wears her down and makes her his mistress. And then she just, she finds that like, she's lost everything that she had worked so hard for. And he's still not giving her anything in return. He still won't leave his wife. She's like more hemmed in than she ever has been. So the movie ends, sorry, spoiler, <laughs> but the movie ends with her like in the airplane about to break this record. And she's pregnant, like with her lover's baby. And she like takes her ox oxygen mask off and she crashes the plane because, and I, I mean, I just think that like, you watch that movie today and you want it to be possible for the movie to end with her saying, well, fuck this guy. I'm just going to raise this child by myself and continue to be like a wonderful, stunning female pilot. And then you understand that it would be impossible to make that movie in the early 1930s. And that if any women in the audience watched the movie and like felt the same way that you feel now watching it, that is subversive and, and that is powerful. 
No, absolutely. Another scene I was really struck by in the book was the dynamic between Howard Hughes and Jean Harlow when she's still a teenager during the filming of Hell's Angels. And you describe Hughes sitting next to the camera telling Harlow to open her negligee wider and wider. And I was just putting myself in her position in this most likely all-male crew feeling so vulnerable. Yeah. Also, the thing about Jean Harlow was that, you know, I mean, there maybe would have been some actresses who were more comfortable with their sexuality, more comfortable with their bodies, who wouldn't have minded, like, that kind of exposure. But she was the opposite of that. She really didn't see herself as being a sexually empowered person. And she was extremely uncomfortable playing this kind of sex bomb. But because she was so good at it, because she became such a hit in Hell's Angels, that became her star persona. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting when you sort of look around at what's happening now with the Me Too movement uh, across all industries. I think, you know, Hollywood, because there's already such a big lens shown on it due to the power of celebrity, has pretty much had to clean up its act. And now you have intimacy coaches that are on movie sets. So something like that would not happen. But this is just in the last two years. Absolutely. Yeah, things are happening so fast. Where's from your vantage point of being a a historian of this, do you feel a a real sea change? And can you pinpoint sort of when that started to shift? Do you think just the fact that people are getting into trouble now Mm -hmm. is is why it's shifting? I think it maybe started earlier than that. Um, I think it might have started with the the election, um, with a run up to the election. I know that the mo- the morning after Donald Trump was elected, I wrote a line in this book that's in the introduction, which is kind of a thesis statement, um, just about how like the time has come where we have to take playboys off a pedestal and really, or quote unquote playboys, this idea of like a great man plows his way through all these women. We have to take them off that pedestal and, and think about the women and think about what their lives are like and what their experiences are like. And I think for a lot of women, just seeing that like, there were so many accusations against Trump. Um, there's so much evidence that he tr- has treated women terribly for so many years, and it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to so many other people. They just don't care. And if anything, they still think it's cool and good. Um, I think it just made people so angry that we started to have a new conversation about these things. And and beyond just the the sexual abuse and abuse of power that's happened in Hollywood, the the sexism of the industry. I mean, as someone who's who's grown up in a Hollywood family, I have four brothers. Um, you know, most of my family's in the movie business. I and I love them. God bless them all. Mm-hmm. But it's a boys' club. I mean, I'm tired of being in rooms where I'm the only woman, and they say, it's the year of the woman. (laughs) And it's like September. So (laughs) there's only like a few months left for it to be my year. I mean, can you even imagine where would, what would women have done back in the 1930s when you had somebody like Eddie Mannix, who, Mm -hmm. I mean, can you tell us a little little bit about him because you've covered him in your series? Yeah, Eddie Mannix was um, the fixer of MGM. So he kind of like, was a satellite of the publicity department. If if the publicists realized there was a problem with a star, they were pregnant, they you know were having some kind of sex scandal, they got into a, a car crash, there was a problem that you needed to keep away from the public, any Mannix would step in and fix those problems. Um, and he also had um, you know a pretty terrible personal life that involved beating his wife, beating mistresses. He was a suspect in the murder of George Reeves, who played the, the actor who played Superman, because of a complicated sexual triangle that was going on with him and his wife and George Reeves. Um, and yeah, he was just you know a, a pretty terrible guy that ruled with an iron fist using violence and intimidation and often a lot of cash to, like to make sure that MGM kept like a relatively lily white persona. And wasn't he responsible for supposedly for um, procuring women for out of town distributors when they would have conventions? Right. There's there's the story that David Sten has reported. Um, he made a documentary. I think it's called Girl Forty Eight or Girl Forty Seven, um, but it's about this woman Patricia Douglas who was just hired for what she thought was a you know a an extra gig, I guess. And it turned out that she was being hired to stand around in in a costume at this party being held for MGM out-of-town salespeople. And at that party, she was raped. Um, And she tried to sue MGM, and she tried to 
to have a, a public accounting for this. And MGM silenced her through Eddie Mannix. And this was just par for the course. Yeah. Well, what was unusual in her case was that she spoke out publicly about it. I mean, most women were successfully silenced before it got to that point. Um, and, you know, and it's, it is, there are parallels to the things that we've seen um, come out recently about, you know, people were afraid that they would never work again. They were afraid that the people close to them would never work again. They thought it was worth it to just accept a cash payment or to accept some kind of remuneration rather than to cause trouble because you didn't want to be known as a troublemaker, you know, or a bitch. How would you define the predatory gaze of Hollywood? Well, that's really complicated. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I think that I, I don't want to say that it's all negative, you know, because I do think that there are imagery, there is imagery of women from mid-century movies and earlier that is really strong and powerful and exciting to watch as a woman, you know, but so much of it is about turning women into objects and, and sexualizing them in a way that dehumanizes them. What's one of your favorite movies or sex, cinematic sex scenes that made you feel empowered? Um, well, I think like Rita Hayworth, I think of her in, in movies like Gilda and even, um, uh, the, the lady from Shanghai, um, you know, like that kind of sexuality of, of where she seems stronger than the men in the film is really exciting. Um, one of the things I was excited to write about in this book was Jane Russell, because even though we now understand that behind the scenes she was being made to do things she didn't always want to do. Her image on screen after the outlaw in movies like Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and and a lot of her other films was very strong and sort of like she had like a withering gaze. And she often was able to express her own like sexual feelings towards men in these movies. And then you have someone like Mae West, who didn't come to Hollywood until she was close to 40 right. and wrote her own scripts. Yeah. So she's kind of and she's kind of an anomaly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea of a woman generating her own material to act in was very unusual in the 1930s when, when Mae West was doing it. Can you think of anyone else in sort of the 30s through the 60s who had that level of output? Mm. I mean, well, Ida Lupino, um, you know, what became the first actress to direct herself in a sound film with The Bigamist, which I think is 1955. Um, but yeah, for the most part, th there wasn't a lot of triple threat actresses out there. No, yeah, probably not until. I, it's funny. I, they're nothing alike, but I, I always think of Tina Fey when mm -hmm. I think when I think of Mae West. Which what was interesting about Mae is that she completely presented herself as this sexualized ideal. Yeah, but w was holding the reins. Yeah, absolutely. I actually like. I am. I'm making a, a podcast episode about her right now. That's going to come out next week, and <gasps> and there's a a lot of it is about um, a lot of it is about the, like the her interplay with Cary Grant in the two movies they made together, where she is really like the sexual aggressor, and he's kind of the wilting ingenue who is just like being pummeled by her advances. She's she's one of my favorites. Yeah, her book on sex, health, and ESP is yeah. is a bible for me. <laughs> There's so many women in this book, Seduction, Sex, Lies, and Stardom, in Howard Hughes' Hollywood, uh, that I'm fascinated by. And one of them who uh, you, you don't get into too much in the book, but you do in your season, Dead Blondes, um, is Barbara Payton. Mm -hmm. And she's rumored to be yet another one of his paramours. Yeah, I couldn't include everybody. And I, so I, I had to make decisions. But um, she's another person I couldn't include who's incredible is Hedy Lamarr. Um, but Barbara Payton, um, in, you know, just a couple of films really like has this really strong presence. And then she used to, I love that she used to go around at night with a crescent moon tattoo. tattoo yeah. She was really into like, uh, yeah, semi-permanent tattoos on her face. And she had quite a wild personal life. Let's talk a little bit about Hedy Lamarr. Um, my father told me that he met her when he was really little. He had seen, somehow he'd seen Ecstasy, a cut of <laughs> Ecstasy. His father had run a print of it. And he said the first time he met her, you know, he'd already seen her topless right. in, that, in that picture. 
I mean, that was, that's incredibly shocking yeah. for the time. Well, yeah, Ecstasy was a film that she made when I, th- I think she was 16 in Germany. Um, and it preceded her arrival in Hollywood. So by the time she got here, when she was a little bit older and she was being uh, molded into a star by MGM, everybody in town had already seen this movie in which she had been naked as a teenager. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. How did you, what was your process in deciding which women's stories you wanted to include and who had to be left out for the time being? Well, it was a juggling act. Um, I, I definitely wanted to have actresses who were spread out over the course of a long period of time. I wanted to be able to tell this whole story of what we call the classical Hollywood era um, and so have these actresses sprinkled throughout. Um, and I wanted to have a balance between pe- like telling things about actresses that are well-known still, like Katherine Hepburn and Ginger Rogers, while also including people who are less well-known, like Faith Domergue and Jean Peters. And then as I was doing the research, a lot of kind of duos started forming. Like it became clear that if you're going to talk about Katherine Hepburn, you have to talk about Ginger Rogers in the same breath because they were at the same studio and they were basically involved with Hughes at the same time. And the same thing with Jean Peters and Terry Moore, who were both at Fox at the same time. They were kind of at the same level of stardom, and they were two of the many women that Howard Hughes was involved with at that time. So once you start, like, finding these little connections, then it it just sort of, like, flows together. Tell us a little more about Terry Moore. So Terry Moore was a child actress, um, and she was a Mormon. And when she was about 19, she met Howard Hughes, and they dated for about a year, but she wouldn't go to bed with him because she had these Mormon beliefs. Um, And he tried to do a couple of um, ad hoc wedding ceremonies. Like, he they drove out to Mulholland, like to Neck. And then he was like, let's get down on our knees and God will marry us right here. Um, And she just like, she was like, okay, but we're not really married. Finally, he was like, okay, Terry, we're really going to get married. So they went out on a boat into international waters and the captain of the boat married them. And I guess Terry was satisfied by that. And so she believed that that was a real marriage. Howard Hughes did not behave as though that was a real marriage. And about a year later, um, Terry caught him involved with another woman, and she left him and did not seek a divorce, but then went and married another guy. And then she ended up leaving that guy for Hughes, and they continued to have an affair over the course of the next few years. Um, And then finally, Terry left him again and married another guy and married another guy, all without ever seeking a divorce from Hughes. When Howard Hughes died, she came forward and publicly said for the first time that they had had this wedding ceremony in 1949 on the boat. And then she spent about 10 years in the courts trying to prove herself to be Howard Hughes' legitimate widow. Um, And I don't want to give away, like, the final lines of the book, so I won't say what happened then, but... It's so interesting, the uh, revolving doors of spouses um, that you detail. And I think that most of the, probably the globe still looks at Hollywood, like, oh, these Hollywood stars can't keep a marriage together. I mean, it's it's obviously a, an industry that fuels um, gossip papers even now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just think also we have to understand that the times were so different. Like, I remember reading a, a quote from Elizabeth Taylor where she was like, yeah, I got married a lot, but I couldn't live with a man unless I was married. I was a movie star. It wasn't allowed. Um, and so to some extent, I think if you were in the public eye, it was just expected that if you did want to have sex with somebody, you were supposed to be married because otherwise it would be this huge public scandal. That's That's true. That's true. It's a lot of pressure to keep um, keep it together and have any sort of personal life as well when yeah. there's that kind of attention directed upon you. And plus, in a lot of cases, you do have the studio trying to manufacture other romances for you and trying to promote another star by saying that you guys like are dating or going to the premieres together or whatever. What's the most shocking sex scene, do you think, if, if sort of from like the 20s through the 50s? I mean, I think the, I don't know if you call it sex, but I think the rape scene in The Outlaw is pretty shocking, especially because of what happens narratively in that movie where Jane Russell's character then just falls in this sort of hypnotic love with her rapist. Can you imagine today yeah. <laughs> this kind of movie being released? And not only that, but that Howard Hughes promoted that aspect of the movie, that he included it like cartoons of her being pinned down in a hayloft in the newspaper advertising. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It was, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so fascinating, this book, which I urge everyone to get a copy of and read if you're interested in 
And if you're interested in old Hollywood, if you're interested in gender roles, if you're interested in anything that's going on today with the Me Too movement, um, it's fascinating too what you're saying about um, him and Terry Moore is that he really was trying, he, he proposed to almost all of these women. Yeah. He was not a playboy who was like um, keeping them at bay. Well, I think that it just, marriage didn't mean anything to him, but he thought it meant something to them. And so I don't think he ever thought that he was going to marry one woman and then not be with other women. But he understood that, like, if he got a ring on their finger, that they would be faithful to him. Did you choose him as a subject because you felt like he would be a good vehicle to tell the stories of these women? Yeah, absolutely. And also because of his continued antagonism of the Hayes Code. I mean, that was a real feature of his work as a producer and then as the owner and manager of RKO. And so if you're going to talk about what it was like to be a woman in Hollywood during this time, like you want to talk about this censorship system and how hypocritical it was and how it how finally it policed sexuality on screen. How did the Hayes Code end? Um, it, it was kind of a slow process. Um, Howard Hughes was one of the people that started defying it pretty regularly in the mid-50s. There was also an Otto Preminger film called The Moon is Blue. Um, these movies, previous to this, movies were not released in, in theaters unless they had the seal of approval from the Hayes Code. And both of these movies deci- didn't get the seal because of sexual content, and their producers and their studios decided to release them anyway. And Samuel Goldwyn was involved with releasing... The moon is blue. I was reading about the he and Howard Hughes going against Hayes. Yeah. So I was wondering what you think of whether Hollywood has a responsibility now when it comes to portraying sex on screen. Because for so long, there was only a certain type of sex portrayed on screen. And and now, for example, I saw this movie Duck Butter Mm -hmm. that was written by Leah Shawat, which um, I don't know how many people saw. I thought it was great. It's particularly because it was a queer love story written from the perspective of a woman, and it it showed sex very honestly. Um, so I'm kind of wondering if Hollywood tr- historically has been a teacher of gender roles or uh, reflecting what sex should be. What, where do you think that responsibility lies now? I mean, I would love it if Hollywood was interested in portraying a wide variety of sexuality in honest and... Um, and non-offensive ways, I don't think that they're interested. I mean, I think that Hollywood movies are less sexual than they ever have been. What do you, I mean, what do you think in terms of, I know Duck Butter's an independent film, but in terms of mainstream Hollywood cinema, I mean, doesn't it seem like they're almost completely sexless? It's true because it's so dependent on foreign box office now to make your money back. Um, so, I mean, when I think of, like, the last big Hollywood films, I saw The Crimes of Grenwald the other night. Yeah. Um, so, it's, like, more fantasy. Um, fantasy, movies for kids, comic book stuff. Like, I love it when you do get, like, a sense of real human connection in those movies, which is very rare. But sometimes, like, there is, like, a flirtatious spark between characters. But, like, that's almost as far as it goes for most of these movies. And there's so few actual adult films being made. That's true. When I think of one of the scene in a movie that really impacted me with female sexualities, like in the last 30 years, I think of Julianne Moore in Shortcuts, of course, yeah. where she's just wearing a shirt, pantsless, and she's got that beautiful red bush. And I thought, oh, what's what's strength? Yeah. What, what sensuality? But also just like a natural situation where she's just like not wearing pants in her house and having a fight with her husband. Yeah. Um, just reflecting real life in that way is so exciting. And and I wish that Hollywood was interested in reflecting real life, but it doesn't seem like they are right now. So do you think we want to see things that reflect our life, or do you think we want to see things that take us out of it? Well, I would like to see things that reflect life, but I think that there must be more commercial demand for escapism because that seems to be what gets produced and it seems to be what makes money. Um, although, you know, I mean, I do think that there is like – there is sometimes aspects of realism that, like, make their way into big blockbusters. I mean, there's there's a lot of, like, really authentic feeling in a movie like A Star is Born. Um, but, you know, not so much in a movie like Venom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I love this podcast. Aw, thank you. I love yours. And everybody needs to listen to The Dead Blonde season, um, among every other season that you've ever done. But... I think that's that's one of my favorites. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Sex Ed. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to visit us at thesexed.com. The Sex Ed is hosted by me, Liz Goldwyn. Jeremy Emery is our sound recordist and editor, and our production coordinator is Justin D.M. Palmer. Louis Lazar made all of our music, including the track you're listening to right now. Until next time, the sex ed remains dedicated to expanding your orgasmic health and sexual consciousness.